Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. May we all greet one another. The word will absolutely be fulfilled. With that, the title for today is The Life That God Is Pleased Of. Today is Reformation Sunday in the church calendar. It commemorates the day when the German religious reformer Martin Luther posted the 95 theses on the door of Wittenberg Castle Church on October 31st, 1517. This event marked the beginning of the 16th century religious reformation aimed at reforming the corrupt and dedicated practices of the Catholic Church at that time. It was the purpose for the reformation of the Catholic Church. As I mentioned in last Friday night's prayer worship, the world celebrates October 31st as Halloween with people dressing up in all sorts of bizarre costumes and freely enjoying their time. They label it, calling it Halloween. And that's what they're doing in the world. This tradition originated from the Celtic people in Ireland who used scary costumes to prevent evil spirits from entering into their bodies. While it may not make much spiritual sense, this has become the culture of Halloween in the world. Additionally, All Saints Day Eve, which is highly regarded by the Catholic Church, is also Halloween. If you go into the Catholic Church, they name all the saints. And they show the coffins and say he was a saint. And they commemorate the saints. It's a culture filled with various idols and superstitions itself. So our remnant committee are conducting the Holy Wind Festival today to accurately convey the spiritual situation of the remnants and equip them to engage in the spiritual battles. We have to have the spiritual eyes to discern what is currently happening in the spiritual reality. We must be able to know why things of the massacre of the Ituan incident had happened. What's the Holy Wind Festival? It means that it's a festival for the wind of the Holy Spirit. If we let our guard down, we might not even realize the strength of Satan's stronghold and just pass it by. The firm partisans of Satan, we may not even know what it is. And they will just pass by. You must live a life of spiritual reformation of 24 hours. It's spiritual reformation of 24 hours. It's this life that you must live. The five solace, the motto of religious reformation, or the spiritual truth that we should hold on to. The spiritual truth does not change. The five things. This is what you must hold on to. It's sola scripture. It's only Bible. Sola fide, only faith. Sola gratia, only grace. Sola Christus, only Christ. Soli Dio Gloria, only glory to God. Amen. The messages we've been looking 
at in the Book of Mark from last Sunday contains the essence of these five solas. The Book of Mark begins with the Declaration, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This book shows how Jesus became the Christ and the Son of God. In today's passage, we see Jesus formally initiating his public ministry. Mark is finally presenting the content of who Jesus is to the people of Israel. In the passage, Jesus' public ministry begins with his baptism by John the Baptist. At this moment, a voice comes from heaven, saying, You are my beloved Son. With you I am pleased. Jesus' public ministry was something that God was pleased of. He heard a voice. Again, it is saying, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. The public ministry of Jesus pleased God. Through today's message, I hope that may all the believers of Vion Church can find an answer to what the life that, that God is pleased of is. Therefore, in the name of the Lord, I bless you to stand confidently as witnesses of the gospel that will possess all the nations. Number one, realizing my spiritual value. Verse 9 reads, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. John the Baptist, who was the first witness of the gospel, testified that Jesus was the Son of God and Christ and faithfully carried out his role in preparing the way for the Lord. He said that Christ, the Messiah whom he bore witness to has all the powers that were beyond the comparison with himself to the extent that he confessed that he was not even worthy to untie his sandals. In John 3.30, John the Baptist made such a confession, He must increase, but I must decrease. That is Jesus Christ. However, in today's passage, we see Jesus coming to John the Baptist to receive the baptism of water. John was performing a baptism of repentance. It's to repent. In reality, Jesus did not need the baptism of repentance because he was without sin. Why? In other words, it's that he was not a descendant of sinful men, but an offspring of women in fulfillment of the prophecy in Genesis 3.15. This is clearly stated in Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. But why did Jesus receive the water baptism from John the Baptist? This act symbolizes Jesus showing his perfection while simultaneously taking upon himself the original sin and the sins committed by mankind as described in Genesis 3. In John 1.29, John the Baptist confesses upon Jesus approaching him, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Due to the original sin committed by the first human, Adam, in Genesis chapter 3, all of mankind found themselves living and dying in sin and under the curse, enslaved to Satan and ultimately destined to go to the path of eternal destruction. That's fate. Fallen mankind was in a state of total depravity, unable to do anything on its own. For an infant, no matter what he did, as soon as he is born, if he does not believe in God, he will go to hell. So the life of salvation of God himself opened the way to restoration, which is through 
the redemption and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This way was restored of salvation. Jesus Christ. At the same time, God is both God of love and God of justice. So he had said that he would restore all sins. God of justice, was th what does this mean? He did not simply leave the issue of sin to be written unresolved and proceed to restore mankind. Someone had to pay for the price of those sins for a restoration to take place. Their sacrificial offering was Jesus himself, just as in the Old Testament times when the priests would offer a young lamb as a sin offering transcending the sins of the lamb. For those who had a lot of sin, it would be a cow. For those who have a little bit of sin, it would be a lamb. And those who are in poverty, they would bring a pigeon. And it's that that animal had to shed his blood for the sin. So Jesus bore the burden of all the sins and carried the cross, much like the symbolism of the Old Testament. This event of Jesus receiving baptism serves as a foreshadowing of the future redemption ministry. In today's passage, when Jesus received baptism and emerged from the water, something incredible happened. Verses 10 to 11 reads, and when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, so with you I am well pleased. As he rose from the water, the heavens split apart, and the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. Then the voice came from heaven, saying, You are my beloved Son, with you I am pleased. Throughout the whole Bible, it's the scene where the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit were present simultaneously. This moment was a profound manifestation of the triune God. It is a great scene. Importantly, these words are grounded in the content of the Old Testament pages like passages like Psalm 2 7 and Isaiah 41 42 1. Psalm 2 7. I will tell of the decree, the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Isaiah 42 1 Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, he will bring forth justice to all the nations. It's evidence that he is the Messiah. It's a declaration. They specifically reveal who Jesus is, emphasizing that Jesus is the Messiah. Indeed, in the cultural context of that time, when Jesus addressed, when God addressed Jesus as my son, it was a declaration of Jesus being the Messiah. These words reveal that Jesus is not only the conquering king with divine authority over the entire world, but also as a suffering servant who would bear the burden of all sins. It was the official proclamation of Christ, the one who would break the power of darkness and bear the weight of all our sins, officially declared as the Christ who removes all the burdens. 
Most importantly, we should be able to hear the same voice of God saying, "You are my beloved son; with you I am well pleased." It is the same voice that affirms us as followers of Jesus Christ, saying, "I love you; with you I am well pleased." Are you most precious? You are most precious of me. Amen. However, many people's expectations of God's voice are not like this. They expect to hear messages like, "I will make you wealthy. I will give you power. I will keep you healthy, or I will promote you." Focusing on self-centered, materialistic, and worldly success. Oriented messages, similar to what we find in Genesis chapter three, six, and eleven. Everything is self-centered, materialistic-centered, and worldly success-centered. People want to hear these voices, even within the church. May you not be deceived. When people acknowledge you being happy, and if they don't, then you lose all your strength. Not caring of what people, not how God looks at you, but upon what people say of you. The voice we fundamentally need to hear from God is the one that acknowledges us as His children, restoring our identity and recognizing us as the most honorable beings. May you be able to hear that voice. That is the voice that you should be joyful of. In other words, we must live a life that realizes our spiritual value. It's my spiritual value. Spiritual value. Of course, the churches who are doing the upper room movement are not like that. But many people, they fight for their seats within the church, wanting people to know their names. But God is not interested in that. And they're not interested in God, and they're only interested in what people say. The Holy Spirit, the Word—they're not interested in that. They just take note of it. It's Genesis chapter three, six, and eleven. So even if they go to church, they can't sing realistic praises, prayers. And see and experience the fulfillment of the word. Zephaniah three seventeen reads: "The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save, who will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will exalt you with loud singing." Can you feel inc how incredible? It is to be the children of God, bestowed with such immense value. God cannot help but to find joy in us. When you have a child, you'll understand. Of course, those who are not married yet, you may not know, but they're so lovable. So the parent wants to give everything to their child, even if they do wrong. To what extent? For the mother, even if the son is sentenced to death, they would say, "My son would never do such a thing. You're not such a person who would do such a thing." That is the love of the mother. Even if it, if one is a murderer. The mother does not see him in that way. When they look at you, I cannot win over my joy. Amen. You must have a spiritual pride. He delights in our mere existence. There are many people who are not loved in this world, culturally speaking, as well. 
even if it may be so, may you be able to receive the love of God. Whether you receive the love of your parents, and for those who receive the love of God, their facial expressions are completely different. They have life in their faces. They have charisma. It's not that they are always having jealousy and hatred and worries. You can tell. Those who are always joyful, those people are very healthy. Those who receive grace, they are very healthy. Of course, within God's special plan, people will be able to have fatal diseases or maybe have cancer. Like John Calvin. He was a walking hospital. But generally speaking, if you receive grace, you will be restored. Because if you, is great, if you receive grace, there is no one that you hate. There is no hatred in your heart. For children of God, you and I, you must know how great of a being you are because you've received this love. He loves us deeply and profoundly to the extent that there's no need for extravagant expressions because his love is so clear and fervent. And that's why you do the walk of faith and walk the path of church officers and as pastors. Are you in joy? You must be joyful in order to be witnesses. Oh, I don't know why God biases me. And then Satan will say, I was thrown away too. How are you so much like me? Those people will not be able to live new lives. What does Jesus, what did God say? Not being able to win over his joy. God is our Father. Just by our existence, He is joyful. It's not because I did something well or not. It's not because we only did what he wanted. When we look at our child, we're just happy looking at them. Just by his existence, he's so lovable. Before Genesis chapter 3 goes in him, and even if Genesis chapter 3 is in him, we love him. How does he love us? He lo loves us still. Furthermore, he rejoices and sings over us with gladness simply because he enjoys us so much. If you really love someone, you don't have to say it. Even if you look at that person, it really touches your heart. Is that right? Have you not experienced this? Joyfully calling your name. Even if he just looks at you, he's joyful. He loves us so much that he sings because he enjoys us so much. So seeing a person who does the walk of faith, well, even for me, they're so lovable. I'm so thankful. Even a pastor like me is like that. But what about the Heavenly Father. He sings due to his joy. 
How can human words describe the wor- love of God towards His people? This wonderful love was already proven on the cross. On the cross, in order to wash away our sins, in order to give us salvation. Romans 5 8 reads, But God shows His love for us that in while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. The cross of Jesus was the seal confirmation that shows God's love for us. God sacrificed His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to love us. Amen? It is the love of God. I truly believe that you are the most precious value in the eyes of God because you have received this seal confirmation by sacrificing His one and only Son. I truly believe that you are the most precious value in the eyes of God. Just as St. Augustine confessed, God loves each one of us as if they were only one of us in the world. As if we're the only ones who are existent. It's to that extent. He realized the love of God. He realized how can God love him so much? So, for quite a long time, I sang the praise. Why does he love me? Why did he sacrifice himself for me on the cross? As I was driving to work, I would sing it, and I would be in tears. And I would park my car and wipe my tears. Questioning, why does God love me so much? I did that when I was a young adult. I've experienced this very deeply. Why does He love me so one-sidedly? At that current situation, it was like hell. But God still gave me that heart. We are His one and only. God created you as His masterpiece. May you have the same confession. The term masterpiece means one and only. It means that it does not exist in the world. No one is just like you. Do not compare yourself against others. Amen? Do not see yourself as the ugly duckling. Do not think that way. You are a swan. Amen? A swan. To the extent where people may think you are too prideful, you have to be bold. Amen? Do you understand? The DNA of the Yemen believers are different. No one is crinkled. No one is pessimistic. We're all healed. Amen? There's nothing that holds us back. I hope that all believers of Yohan Church will truly experience the fact that you are being loved by God the most and hold on to the spiritual pride. The spiritual pride. Not being filled with hearts of poverty and inferiorities. The three only is word, prayer, and evangelization. 
by the three onlys? As it was passed, I realized that I was healed by this. It was completely healed. In the field, it was healed. Even now, in front of God, if you are not satisfied, may you be able to restore this. And then, God will one sidedly. Even if everyone fails and falls down, I will not fall down and fail. Everyone is finished, but I'm not finished because God gives me that strength. I bless you in the name of the Lord that may all the believers of you in church will live a life that pleases God the most and spiritually highly soar. May that be our walk of faith. Number two, the life that raises the partisan of the word. Verses 12 to 13 reads, The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was the, in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was in, with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to them. Mark recorded that Jesus, the coming Messiah, who was taking out the ministry of Christ, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. You must understand that the reason Jesus, who had no reason to be tempted, underwent the temptation was to fully understand human fragility. It's to experience this. Hebrews 4.15 reveals that Jesus, the high priest, had no sin but had been tempted just as man, as complete man. He was a hundred percent man, do you understand? It's not that Jesus was 90% something else. He was a hundred percent man, hundred percent God. If you don't believe in this, it is a cult. Jesus overcame and claimed victory by enduring every child tempted to face as human beings. This is what is being said. It is not described in detail in today's scripture, but in Luke chapter 4, Jesus was tempted by Satan by three different temptations. The first temptation was related to the basic instinct of hunger after 40 days of fasting prayer. For those who have fasted, you know, your drive of hunger. When you see other people eating, you go crazy. Your taste buds. So when you're fasting, when there are children or adults who left behind some biscuits or bread. I don't eat it. But if it's left behind, I question why did they leave that behind? And that's what he was tempted with. It's very difficult. Oh, because he's Jesus. But Jesus is 100% man. Satan asked Jesus if he could command stones to become bread if he was truly the Son of God. If you look at stones, sometimes they look like bread. This temptation was to test Jesus if he would compromise his spiritual values for worldly things. In the second temptation, Satan showed Jesus all the authority and glory of the kingdoms of the world and said they would be his if he bowed down and worshipped Satan. Satan tempted him with worldly power and tried to change the object of his worship in history. We can see that the Korean churches were told to bow down to the Japanese shrine. And there were pastors who did that, and they say that they still repent until now for doing so. But for Pastor Kitar Ju and many other pastors, they did not bow down and they were martyred for that. But Satan says, just do it just once, and then you'll be forgiven. 
the object of worship, change it. In the last temptation, Satan took Jesus to the high point of the temple and asked him if he would throw himself down from the top if he were truly the Son of God. This was an assault using pride and vanity. Having a seat as a chair. I'm not going to say who it is. I'm going to be the best. Many people stiffen their necks for that. Then and now. In these three tests, we should see a parallel of the temptations that Adam and Eve faced in the Garden of Eden by Satan. Satan attempted to attack Jesus using the same temptations that caused the first man, Adam, to fail. However, he completely failed in this attempt. While the first man, Adam, failed these tests and led all of humanity down the path of eternal destruction, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, triumphed in every test and led us to the path of eternal life. So how grateful we should be. How thankful should we be? When we die, we will absolutely right away go to heaven. The crucial point to emphasize is that Jesus defeated all these tests using the words recorded in Deuteronomy. He established a stronghold of the word, the partisan of the word. No matter what trials come our way in the world, we have a weapon to overcome them. That is the word. The word. As Ephesians 6.10 states, to stand against the devil, we must put on the whole armor of God and the one attacking weapon in that armor is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God. The written Word of God and preached Word delivered week after week becomes a spiritual force that can overcome any test that comes your way. How great of a blessing it is this. Why does Satan make you become so busy and not be able to give worship? You're supposed to receive grace, but why do you think about other things during the times of worship, making your hearts be like the thorns and gravel and the path? All problems of Genesis chapter 3 may exist, but you have the word, so you can win with that word. So may you be able to remember the pulpit. The famous Presbyterian preacher, Pastor Thomas Watson, emphasized saying, don't just receive information from the Bible. Let the Bible set your heart on fire. Oh yes, those are good words. You received grace. It's not with that standard. It's not just trying to receive spiritual, physical, information but set your heart on fire in Luke 24 32 we can see the disciples on the road to Emmaus who met the resurrected Jesus he explained to the scriptures to them and in response the disciples confessed they said to each other did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures. The confession indicates that their hearts were set on fire by the word. So I bless you in the name of the Lord that 
May all you one believers become the main figures of the team of three and the three movements by living a life initiated by the word and changing the field as establishing the partisan of the word. This is the conclusion. The term practical atheist refers to someone who in their thoughts and beliefs acknowledges the existence of God, but in their actual life lives as if God does not exist, living without any connection to God. In other words, these individuals might be active in attending the church, but in their day-to-day -day lives, lives as if God is absent, often feeling discouraged and living in despair. Always being filled with greed and hate, as if they were non-believers. They are the practical atheists. It's that they don't believe. Of course, the Father, Son, and Spirit, they went to church 30, 40 years, so of course they know. They go to church diligently. But in their lives, God does not exist. As I see it, most people are like that. Not our church, but other churches. Not many exist. Do not be surprised. You'll be really surprised on how God does not exist, especially in the field of politics. Do you think that God works only upon the pastors because we are pastors who really does not pray, generally speaking, are the pastors who really loves the souls. They're the church officers. Of course, they take note of what is in the church bulletin. Upon those who receive grace, those who pray, who experience the word, who receive training. The Korean churches have lost their strength. They're facing challenges because of the prevalence of the practical atheists. It is important that we change this in the field. And this is the reason that they are not giving influence in the field. So non-believers say, yes, you go to church, so you speak so well. But nothing is put into action in their lives. They lie very well. So what would the non-believers say? 80% of the people in the streets, they went to church. But it's not they receive trials that they don't go to church anymore. Oh, that person lied to me. No matter what church it is, they have this. So doing the ministry, serving you and in the field, do you know how difficult it is? The pastors, when they say something, you must be able to obey. Just follow in faith. But saying, oh, that person has no strength. And it's just a female assistant pastor saying pessimistic things. 
those people are all practical atheists. It's that they honestly don't believe. Those who believe, they don't say bad things, especially regarding the servants of the Lord, saying that person is right or wrong. Even if he is a young assistant pastor, he has been appointed by God, even though he is lacking, you must be able to pray without words. And that is the practical believer, those who receive grace. I bless you in the name of the Lord that may all you unbelievers would firmly recognize your spiritual worth in your everyday lives, establishing the baptism of the word, striving to live a life that God is pleased of, as you and church believers must be different in the field of your church, in your lives, may you be able to make God pleased where God will be so pleased of you that he doesn't know what to do. May you daily receive answers, experiences, and live your lives. Let us pray. Dear Father God, upon the life that God is joyful of, the spiritual value, may I be able to know my spiritual identity as well. Upon the word that is being daily proclaimed, may it be imprinted within me and establishing the word, the partisan, and believe to be witnesses of the word. And in our field, may we be able to shine the light. And may we be able to guide those who are within darkness to the light. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.